You are listening to the first segment of our four-part series, The Three Traditions of Healing, with Susan Weed at Sky Blue Symposia. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. I'm Gemini, your host for our symposium with Susan Weed. Susan is an American herbalist and director of the Wise Women's Center located near Woodstock, New York. She is known for her writing and teaching of what she describes as the Wise Women Way of Herbalism. Susan is the author of five books and a contributor to the Ratledge International Encyclopedia of Women's Studies and writes a regular column in Sage Woman and for Awakened Woman Online. You can learn more about Susan by visiting SusanWeed.com. Hello, Susan. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia. Green blessings. I'm so glad to be here with you. And tonight, I understand we're going to discuss the three traditions of healing. Yes, you know, one other really amazing thing that happens when you get past 65 is that you can actually look back on your life and try to see if you've had any good ideas. And in looking back on my life, I can see three very good ideas that I've had. But I want to start off with the idea of the three traditions of healing, which simply means that there are three primary ways to think about healing. When I was a little girl, one of the most you know, special days of the whole year, a day in which I got new clothes to wear and new underwear was the day in which I was taken to the doctor for my annual physical exam. And there, at that annual physical exam, I learned some of the most important things I ever learned about healing. The first one was that the doctor would poke and prod and look in odd places that other people didn't at me. And when he was done with all of this, he would turn to my mother and say, she's in perfect health. What did I learn? I learned that my health had nothing to do with me, but everything to do with those in charge who were around me, those in the know. And then, having proclaimed me to be in perfect health, the doctor would proceed to give me a shot, a booster, right? a booster immunization. And so I learned the second most important thing I ever learned about healing, which is if you're healthy and you want to stay healthy, you need drugs. You need shots. You need things that the experts can give you. Well, being a baby boomer, being born in fact the year that the peace was signed, I was part of the the generation that was told that modern medicine and drugs were going to eliminate disease from the face of the planet with the introduction of antibiotics, with the the drugs that that we had that were suddenly coming out, things really looked earth-shattering and different. For me, however, as an individual, what was really earth-shattering and different was that my parents decided to have another child. Whatever possessed them, I still don't understand, but I was unhappy about not being an only child anymore. The only way that I felt that I could express my unhappiness about this, because many channels were blocked to me, was to get a bladder infection. And it worked very well, because I got a very bad bladder infection. I got a lot of intention, which is what I wanted. And so thereafter, throughout my childhood, whenever I needed attention or things were making me very unhappy, I would get a bladder infection. In fact, I had so many bladder infections that I thought that urine was colored orange because the drug that they gave me, Gantrosin, to help deal with my bladder infections caused your urine to turn orange. You know, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and it was... It was a place where I couldn't 
find any real people. I knew they existed. I just couldn't find them in Dallas. And so I endeavored to leave high school before I graduated, and I went to UCLA. And there, one day, I saw, sitting in the cafeteria, an old woman. She must have been all of 30. And nowadays on college campuses, it's pretty common to see people of a great many different ages. But in the early 60s, when I was at UCLA, basically the people who were going to college were quite young. And the people who were older were the people who were the assistant professors and the professors. You just didn't see a 30-year-old in the cafeteria. Being a curious sort, I went over to where she was, sat down beside her and said, what are you doing here? And she said, what do you mean? I'm here at UCLA. I'm a student. I said, oh, you're a student? You're so old. And she said, well, I'm a, doing a career change. I said, oh, really? Well, what career have you had? She says, I've been a public health nurse. I said, doesn't sound so bad. She says, well, you know, it's so disturbing to me to see young women having kidney failure from taking a drug that counters bladder infections. Well, it was though someone had suddenly turned on a light in a dark room. No one had ever mentioned to me privately or publicly that there was ever any possibility that the drugs that were going to eliminate disease and change the world could have bad side effects. I know this sounds horribly naive nowadays, you know, 50 years later, but that's what we believed back then. My jaw must have dropped open, but I managed to get it together enough to say to her, is, is the, the drug you're talking about, does it turn your urine orange? And she said, yes, that's the one. And I said, my goodness, how can you tell if your kidneys are okay? And she said, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? And I said, like everyone else, my back hurts. She said, not like everyone else. Your back is not supposed to hurt. You're a young woman. You're not even 20 yet. That is your kidneys hurting. Truly, I was astonished and flabbergasted. I don't even have words for what happened to my world view at that point. I had believed that the experts knew what they were doing and they were making me healthy. And here I was hearing from an expert that this simply wasn't like many people who find this out. I went looking for something different. Surely I thought there must be some other way to address my bladder infections besides taking this drug. What else could it be? Now, as many people have heard, in 1965, I moved to Manhattan. And one day, I felt compelled to go to the main branch of the public library in Manhattan. Walked up those stone steps, up past those big stone lions, and into the library, walked up to the desk and up to the librarian and said, I want books on earth. For many, many years, people would say to me, what made you do that? What made you go to the library and ask for books about earth? And I would say, I don't know. And then one of my aunts, Aunt Vicky, who's now fishing for salmon somewhere in her idea of heaven. Aunt Vicky said to me, did you know that your great-grandmother was a village herbalist in Switzerland? So I now think, of course, that she must have been whispering in my ear or pulling my strings or tickling me in my sleep to get me to go and find out about herbs. Well, the librarian went and found all four books that the library had about herbs, and three of them told me to put basil with my tomatoes and, and dill with my cucumbers, and it's good advice, but it's not the advice I was looking for at that point. Had I read, say, German or French or Russian, I'm sure I would have found much more, even in that library, but luckily, I was part of the strings that the grandmothers were pulling, and within the next five or six years, 
more and more people would come forth to write about herbs and herbal medicine and some of the older books that had been almost finished in the 50 years between the 1900s and the real introduction of drugs to medicine and the 1950s and 60s when herbal medicine started to rekindle in the United States. I was lucky to catch the very edge of that wave, that resurgence of herbal medicine, which I now call people's medicine. And it pulled me in to some pretty strange places. First of all, I was told if I had a bladder infection, it was my own fault. And the reason that I had that bladder infection was probably because I was filled with CRAP or toxins in the more common parlayer. And that I needed to cleanse and to get rid of those things. And it's I cleansed myself and purified body, mind, and spirit, then I could expect to be well. Well, I had, as you heard, a, a astonishing awakening to the, the possibility of harm, actually, coming to me from modern medicine, and sure enough, it didn't take long before I saw that this other kind of medicine, alternative medicine, also had a grim side as well. One of my friends, who's also interested in, you know, herbal medicine and alternative medicine, what else could we do, decided to do a three-day watermelon fast. And ordinarily, that wouldn't have been such a bad idea, except she was an unsuspected diabetic. And she went into a coma after eating watermelon for three days, and we could never rouse her, and she died. And I was astonished because none of the books that I was reading ever mentioned that you could die from eating nothing but watermelon for three days. Now, I want to condense what probably took me, oh, seven or eight years into a few sentences for you here. And so you find Susan, you know, and she is reading a book, and it says that you have to cleanse by drinking carrot juice and eating raw food. And so Susan, being a good girl, goes off to the store and buys a juicer and 25 pounds of organic carrots and probably could have lived happily ever after if she hadn't bought another book. Now we see Susan sitting at home drinking her carrot juice and reading the new book, and the new book says if you eat anything that's raw or drink anything that's juiced, then it's really bad for your health. The only thing that's good for your health is brown rice. And every meal should be centered around brown rice. Now, Susan, the good girl, goes back to her health food store, and she buys her 25-pound bag of organic brown rice and her pressure cooker and, of course, some adukey beans and some seaweed. And she once again might have lived happily ever after if she hadn't bought another book. And now we see her sitting at home eating her rice, her adukey beans, and her seaweed and reading the book. And it says, if you eat rice and beans together, you will not be able to digest them and you will get sick. And so Susan goes back to the store and she buys every chart they have on food combining and wallpapers her rather small kitchen with all these charts. Now we see her sitting there at midnight, eating a piece of watermelon. And we know that it's midnight because you can't eat watermelon within six hours of any other food. And we know it's watermelon. Because when you look at all of the charts together, there is nothing else that's safe to eat. When in to Susan's health and into Susan's heart, and into Susan's mind comes something new. Another friend of mine comes in with a book by Juliet de Berkeley Levy, Common Herbs for Natural Health. And I begin to read this book. 
and as I said, some seven or eight years have passed. Yule Gibbons and a variety of other people have come forth to start talking about herbs and herbal medicine and eating wild plants. And I've been reading some of these books, and you know what? Many of them are really, like, kind of dull and dry. And here is a woman who, instead of saying rosemary, rosmarinus officinalis, a perennial evergreen shrub with opposite lanceolate, evergreen leaves, and blue flowers in the axil, says, rosemary is ross, the tears, marinus of the sea. The tears of the sea, rosemary, rosmarinus officinalis, she is an official medicinal plant and she loves to grow draped over stone walls by the ocean side. It is said her flowers are blue because Mary threw her robe upon her when she was on the way to have the baby Jesus. Now, already this is so much more interesting. And this book, I soon found, was written by a woman who was not just going over the facts, but was sharing her own personal experience with this. Now, Juliet de Berkeley Levy herself is very much in to fasting and cleansing and toxins, and yet she was the gateway for me to see into another way of thinking about healing, into a way that is compassionate, that is accepting and enfolding, that doesn't try to push anything away, to cleanse anything, to fix anything, but instead seeks to widen, to open up more, to be holistically more. What does holistically mean and how do we spell it? W-H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C holistic looks like it means the whole thing. But the correct spelling is H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C holistic because it refers to a Hologram, H-O-L-O-G-R-A-M. A hologram is a special kind of image, which is made with laser light. I won't go into the de- technical details of it, but suffice to say that laser is actually an acronym for laser something, something, something. So there's a special way with mirrors that the laser light is bounced off objects and causes a three-dimensional hologram to be created of them, which you can actually walk around and see various views of. But even more interestingly, you can take that hologram and you can divide it in half. And instead of having a top half and a bottom half of the hologram, you have two entire full and complete holograms, both of which are a little blurrier than the original. And you can keep cutting, dividing, separating pieces off of the hologram over and over and over again each time, getting full and complete images each time a little blurrier. And so I began to see that each one of us is a hologram and is whole because whole and healthy and holy all come from the same root. Sanskrit word, that if I envisioned myself as a hologram, I could see that I was already perfect, already whole, just as I am. I don't need anything more to make me whole, and I certainly don't want to purge anything out, but that I could reclaim pieces of myself and increase my definition. Kind of like high-definition television, isn't it? You don't even really notice that the image on that screen is blurry until you see what it's like to see it sharply. So I began to pursue this hologram of wholeness, this hologram of health. I began to 
to follow the path to see where that path could possibly lead me. And I had some help in getting there. I had a mentor who lived about 30,000 years ago. I see the wise woman. She is old and black and walks with the aid of a beautifully carved stick. She's the ancient grandmother of us all, and she represents health, wholeness, and holiness in the wise woman tradition. She's the one who brought me here. She brought me to the wise woman tradition, and she has guided me in all of my writings. I have been following her traces for years, finding here and there a thread from her cloak. I find many of her threads, vibrant threads, when I visit with and read about Aboriginal women. The Aboriginal woman, the original woman, the earth-based woman, the woman of earth colors, the woman of the mother culture speaks to me. She speaks in a gesture, in a color, in a glance. She speaks in a smile, in a song, in a dance. She speaks to me of wise woman ways. The crippled old black woman winks at me and spreads her arms. These are the ways of our ancient grandmothers, the ancient ones who still live. These wise women are one with all life as they tread the ever-changing spiral. Every pain, every plant, every stone, every feeling, every problem is cherished as teacher. Not teacher who grades, but teacher who guides. Night is love for darkness and the stars. Day is love for light and the sun. Uniqueness is our treasure, not normalcy. Our universe includes all. It is a both-and universe, not an either-or universe. And this is the wise woman way the world round. These are the ways of our ancient grandmothers, the ancient ones who still live. These wise women receive nourishment from and give nourishment to the great mother of all. They receive her abundance with compassion, knowing they themselves will be food for others. They know that dying is the portal to the existence of death as birth is the portal to the existence of life. They celebrate all comings and goings. This is the wise woman way, the world round. These are the ways of our ancient grandmothers, the ancient ones who still live. These wise women spin the invisible thread which weaves us all together. They invite you to weave the threads of your own life back into the cloak of the ancient one, the holy blanket of the wise woman. They thank you for reweaving wherever you can the sacred threads of planetary, animal, plant, and personal kinship. These are the ways of our ancient grandmothers, the ancient ones who still live. The joy of life is the giveaway. They give you a gift of a robe, a robe woven of unconditional self-love, luminous, resonant, shimmering. Here, put it on. <laughs> Do you feel it? As you emerge through the neck hole, you become the center of the universe. All revolves around you, the world's axis, life's matrix, the still point in the ever-moving, the designs of the universe itself radiate down your sleeves and bodice. It is an ancient design. Lift your arms. You are the tree of life, the goddess unique and whole. And as you trace the invisible way of the wise woman wearing your robe, know that the ancient ones offer you safe journey. They offer you safe journey and the possibility of finding yourself healthy, whole, and holy. This is the wise woman way, the world round. I see the wise woman. She carries a blanket of compassion. She wears a robe of wisdom. Around her throat flutters a veil of shifting shapes. From her shoulders, a mantle of power flows. A story band encircles her forehead. She stitches a quilt. 
She spins fibers into yarn. She knits. She sews. She weaves. She ties the threads of our life together. She forms a web of spiral and thread. I see the wise woman. She is at her loom, a loom warped with days and nights. White threads, black threads receive her flying shuttle, a shuttle filled with threads of many colors, threads the colors of the earth, the common ground, threads the colors of the people of the earth, some threads short, some threads long, each thread different, each thread perfect. These threads are alive with sound and color. These threads are mutable. They change at a touch. These threads are crystal antennae. They respond at a thought. And intertwined with each thread is a thread, blood red, a thread of such sensitivity it cannot be seen yet, a thread of such vitality it can never be hidden. As our blood flows over and under the days and nights of our lives and binds each moment of the home, so the red thread of the wise woman binds us in the tapestried cosmic web. I see the wise woman, and she sees me. And so we have the three traditions of healing. The scientific tradition which measures and fixes. She's in perfect health, so we'll give her a shot. The experts know what they are doing. We don't need to know. And if you want to stay healthy, you need to take drugs. The scientific tradition is what many people call modern medicine. It's sometimes called orthodox medicine. But I won't tolerate it being called traditional medicine because, in fact, herbal medicine is traditional medicine. And modern medicine really isn't traditional at all. And the heroic tradition, the tradition that pokes and pukes and purges, the tradition that cleanses and limits, the tradition that tells you what you can and can't do. Now, drinking carrot juice and eating brown rice seem like Two very different things, but what ties them together is both of them say this is the way you have to do it. And we find this in the heroic tradition, that there is this great insistence on what we have to do. And the wise woman tradition, which nourishes the uniqueness of the individual. The scientific tradition is a straight line. On one side of the line is health, and on the other side of the line is sickness. Or we could say at one end is health, and the other end is sickness. If you ask someone practicing in the scientific tradition to define health, their definition would be the absence of sickness. So, gosh, it's pretty hard to want to achieve something that there isn't really a definition Hmm. In the heroic tradition, the symbol is a circle. Sometimes we see three circles representing body, mind, and spirit. However, as soon as we break someone into body, mind, and spirit, we must admit that we no longer have a wholeness because we have broken them into pieces. And how can we even begin to think that there are things that affect only the body and not the mind and the spirit or any one of them you choose? They are all, in fact, very much together. The heroic tradition with its symbol of uh, the circle focuses very much on giving us a sense of control. Whereas the scientific tradition says things happen, the heroic tradition says you make things happen. And the wise woman tradition, whose symbol is a spiral, that ever-moving, ever-changing spiral, in which there can't be any rules because the spiral is always growing. The spiral is always moving. Well, as we can see, there's a lot to talk about with these three traditions. And so next week, I'm going to be back and I'm going to talk to you about the scientific tradition. 
And then the week after that, I'll come back and talk to you about the heroic tradition. And then the third week, we will wrap up and we will be talking about the wise woman tradition so that we will get a more in-depth, personal and up-close look at each one of these traditions and have a sense of what part of me thinks in that way and when do I want my health care to come from the scientific tradition, when do I want it to come from the heroic tradition, and when do I want to seek out the wise woman tradition. The more we know about the three traditions, the easier it is for us to get exactly the health care that we most want. This is Susan Reed, and it has been a pleasure being able to offer this information to you. Thank you for opening your hearts and your minds to all that I have to say, and I will be back next week. Stay tuned. Thank you, Susan. That was lovely. I enjoyed that. Thank you. This completes the first segment of our four-part series, The Three Traditions of Healing with Susan Weed at Sky Blue Symposia.